Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I'm going to give you a few moments to get comfortable, take your seats, and then we would like to commence with proceedings for the day. There are just a few more people taking their seats. I must tell you, this is one of the greatest things about doing events with academics. When you speak, they listen. It really is fantastic. So thank you very, very much, ladies and gentlemen. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I thought I would start with this today. Now, I know when I hear the words Nobel Prize or Nobel Symposium, there are a few things that come to mind first and foremost, right? Now, in my mind, there are two things that come to mind. I think, one, very smart people, right? Makes sense, doesn't it? Smart people, and then I think people who have theories about different things. So I thought I wanted to start with a theory today, Rohn's theory. Do you all know about Rohn's theory? I'll tell you about Rohn's theory. Rohn's theory says that you become like the five people you hang out with the most. So ladies and gentlemen, all I'm saying is if my day is starting with you, I'm well on track to becoming pretty smart. <laughs> pretty smart, ladies and gentlemen. Now on that note, allow me to say a very special warm welcome to very important guests this morning. His Excellency, Swedish Ambassador to South Africa, Hukan Juholt and his team, Interim Chair of the Steers Board, Bernard Latehan, who is also the Steers Founding Director and also other board members, Rector and Vice Chancellor of Stellenbosch University, Wim de Villiers and the Rectorate, Ingrid Sandstrom, Executive Director, Marcus and Amalia Wallenberg Foundation, and also a board member. Symposium conveners, Jakob Svensson and Rulof Berger. Distinguished guests, symposium participants, ladies and gentlemen. And on that note, allow me to also say a very special welcome to Nobel laureates, Abhijit Banerjee and Esther Duflo, who won the Nobel Prize for Economic Sciences in 2019. Great to have you here. Where are you seated? Abhijit and Esther. Abhijit over there. Esther? Am I not? Don't, not, not a problem. Not, oh, there we go. There we go. They've got Esther. Oh, outside. Okay, I was just double checking. So, 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 Abhijit and Esther, I'm just double checking. If you see me sitting with them a little bit later on, I'm sure you understand based on Rohn's theory why I'm sitting with them, right? Okay, so that's perfectly fine. Ladies and gentlemen, just a bit of a background on the Nobel in Africa Symposium Series. Now, the Nobel Symposia has been held since 1965, but in 2022, it was held on the African continent for the very first time. Now then, it was the Physics Symposium. Last year, in 2023, it was the Chemistry Symposium. And this year, of course, the 2024 Nobel Symposium in Economic Sciences. Now, I think you're looking at me and you're thinking, yo, this girl is pretty smart, right? She knows what she's talking about. That's it for now. Like, at this point, my smartness stops, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Tracy Lang. I am a radio and TV presenter here in Cape Town, South Africa. And I am actually known for many really silly jokes. But now, of course, like I mentioned, I thought to myself, well, Nobel Symposium, smart people, I can't just tell any type of jokes, right? So I went and I Googled a few jokes. I came across so many really good jokes, but I didn't understand any of them. So I decided to move along from there and rather allow the smart people to speak today. And on that note, I now want to move on to our first speaker for today. Now, Edward K. Chirumira is a professor of medical sociology and a director of the Stellenbosch Institute for Advanced Study. He is also professor extraordinary at Stellenbosch University. He is a member of the Academy of Sciences of South Africa fellow of the Uganda National Academy of Sciences, UNAS, and executive committee member of the International Human Rights Network of Academies and Scholarly Sciences, IHRN. He has conducted extensive research and program advisory work in HIV and AIDS, population and reproductive health, emergent diseases, and international health issues. He has taken up technological technical advisory roles for international organizations, including UNAIDS, UNDP, UNFPA, CEDA, Sweden, NORAD, Danida, USAID, and USNAS, and has had in-country technical advisory and academic research work in more than 20 
African countries. Ladies and gentlemen, please put your hands together for CS Director Edward K. Chirumira. Thank you very much, Tracy. If you ever heard of somebody setting you up, she's just set me up. Um, but I'll try and do my bit. Uh, Your Excellency, um, the MC has worked through protocol beautifully, and suffice then to say that welcome to you all here present and those that have joined us online, all protocol observed. I start from a very nice note that we had a fantastic evening. So thank you very much for all of you that attended the dinner last night. And for those that didn't attend the dinner, you really missed. Uh, but I'm sure that you'll catch up as you listen to the um, presentations as well as the coffee and lunch and, and different breaks. And I encourage that we do a lot of networking through that. Um, so very well, warm welcome to Stellenbosch Institute for Advanced Study. Welcome to uh, Stellenbosch, and particularly welcome to the Nobel in Africa Economic Sciences Nobel Symposium, convening under the theme of microdevelopment research in the last 20 years with a footnote, what have we learned? We are pleased to partner with Stellenbosch University, and thank you very much, uh, Rector and Vice Chancellor, to host the symposium with other South African universities to carry out the symposium associated outreach. We've been at UWC, UCT, and on Friday, there'll be a group that goes to the National Treasury Policy Roundtable in Pretoria. So we're trying to bring together all the facets of development in that particular respect. We're also pleased that we'll have 11 young African scholars who will attend the symposium and participate in a working work uh, in writing workshop, and thank you, Ingrid, as part of STIA's aim to contribute to uh, Africa growing its own timber. STIA's motto summarizes what we are, a creative space for the mind. That's all we give, and that's all, that's our currency, a creative space uh, for the mind. And our vision is to advance scholarship across all disciplines and invest in the intellectual future on the African continent in conversation with the other internationally renowned scientists and creative artists. So we have fellows that come here for all disciplines, and what we expect of them is lunch from Monday to Friday, and none has complained, and also a seminar, a fellow seminar, as well as a public lecture that we showcase what we're doing um, at STEERS. The focus on Africa and the Global South is also epitomized by our STEERS Isolomso Fellowship Program the eye of tomorrow in Isikosa. The institute convenes science across disciplines, generations, and continents, and the institute provides an independent space where innovative ideas and original thinking can and does thrive, challenging and pushing boundaries, serendipitously disrupting, of course in a constructive way, individual and collective thought. So it's a space where you challenge even your own self. And we've seen fantastic um, ideas coming out of this. So because STIRS does not own the outcome of its convenings, um, we seek partnerships through inviting fellows in residence and with institutions and networks within the scholarly environment locally and internationally. May I ask the fellows in residence to please stand up for recognition, just to show off my bright people. <laughs> Thank you very much. I mentioned, I, I should say at that, that uh, we do invite applications for senior fellows for mid-level career scholars. We have a one year advance warning, uh, but uh, we hope that you can look us up and we 
I'm going to expect that each one of you that is here for this uh, symposium is going to become a fellow at least in the next four or five years. Um, so I'm looking forward, I'll be ticking. I have the list of participants. So I'll be ticking to see how many do visit us again, either as fellows or just visiting scholars. I mentioned at the launch of the initiative in October 2022 that, the African, fire, that the African fireplace a place of convening and sharing wisdoms and passing them on to the next generation symbolizes the spirit in which Steers receives the honor to host the Nobel Symposium on the African continent. We are proud and privileged to represent the African scholarly environment in that, um, in that uh, regard. And Tracy has already uh, said a bit more about the Nobel in Africa. I should mention that we're privileged that we're going to host these symposia into the 2029-2030. And thanks to the Wallenbergs Foundation grant and the permission and the license from the Nobel Foundation uh, to do that. So you're going to come back. It's not just one event, it's a series of symposia in the Nobel in Africa uh, symposium series. And we'll be doing for all categories of the Nobel uh, Prize. I think there's now uh, almost a tentative that will also do literature and also peace. So that will complete the series of the Nobel um, Prize category. I have a strong conviction that St Steers Nobel in Africa initiative represents an exciting, internationally mutually beneficial scholarly partnership long enough for our mid-level career African scholars to work towards a Nobel Prize. So please don't disappoint me, I can see Louis there. Uh, by the time we are done with the Nobel in Africa, our young scholars here will be Nobel laureates. Thank you to the represent, representatives of all the universities and research institutions and government, scholarly networks, and all of you friends of STEERS here present online and in spirit with us. I invite you all to share in this momentous occasion and to celebrate convening of economic sciences, what have we learned for the greater benefit of mankind? Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Edward. We now move on to our next speaker, Rector and Vice-Chancellor for Stellenbosch University, Wim de Villiers. Thank you very much, Tracy, and welcome friends, colleagues, and members of the public. What Tracy, uh, so I'm Wim de Villiers, I'm the Rector and Vice-Chancellor. What Tracy didn't tell you is that I'm also a gastroenterologist. Uh, so we're well known for some very bad gastroenterology jokes. Uh, but I promised the Dean of the Faculty of, of Economics and Management Sciences, Professor Ingrid Woolard, last night that I will not tell any such joke. And she's giving the thumbs up there. So, okay, so I'm, I'm taking my cue from her. So it is a great pleasure to welcome you to this opening session of the Nobel Symposium in Economic Sciences, hosted by the Stellenbosch Institute of Advanced Study and in collaboration with Stellenbosch University. And it's a, really a proud moment for Stellenbosch University to be able to present this. It, this symposium marks the third installment in the very prestigious Nobel in Africa series. And it really uh, underscores this enduring partnership uh, between STIAS, Stellenbosch University, and the esteemed Nobel Foundation. So the theme of this symposium Microdevelopment research in the last 20 years, what have we learned? And the theme really embodies a commitment to fostering cutting edge scholarship and advancing our collective understanding of economic development in Africa and beyond. And we are so honored to have so many distinguished guests and luminaries in the field of economics, including, including our conveners, Jakob Svensson of Stockholm University, and Rolof Berger of Stellenbosch University. So today's gathering 
represents more than just a meeting of minds. It symbolizes the strong and mutually beneficial relationship between South Africa and Sweden, as exemplified by this Nobel in Africa initiative. This partnership, nurtured by the collaborative efforts of STIAS and Stellenbosch University, really emphasizes our shared dedication to promoting world-class scientific research and innovation on the African continent. What we do as a research-intensive university at Stellenbosch University is to do research that's locally relevant, regionally impactful, but globally competitive. We're, very, we're particularly delighted to welcome His Excellency uh, Ambassador Hugolt, the Swedish Ambassador to South Africa, and Ingrid Sundström, representing the Wallenberg Foundations, whose generous support have been instrumental in making this symposium possible. We're very privileged to be joining by economics Nobel laureates Esther Duflo and Abhijit Banerjee, who will also grace us with their insights during, during the Chancellor's public lecture tonight. So as we embark on this intellectual journey, let us embrace the spirit of collaboration, curiosity, and innovation that defines the ethos of STIAS and Stellenbosch University. And together, let us explore new frontiers of knowledge and chart a course towards a brighter, more prosperous future for Africa and the world. So once again, welcome to the Nobel Symposium in Economic Sciences in Africa. No gastroenterology jokes. Thank you for your presence and participation. Thank you. Vim, I'm definitely coming to you for a few of those jokes. I'm reaching out to you a little bit later on. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I know I mentioned earlier on that, of course, I tried to Google a few jokes, but I didn't understand any of the jokes. However, Google is good for a few other things. So now, allow me to say, Welkommen tal CNN. Did I get it right? I got it right. He can tell you what I said. To Swedish ambassador to South Africa, Håkan Juholtz. Wow, and I was, uh, I was impressed when I saw the guest list, and now, wow, how impressed I am. Fluently Swedish, wow. Let's continue the conversation in Swedish, you and I, later on. I will make some jokes in Swedish, I promise you. Uh, thank you so much for, for inviting me as a Swedish ambassador to, to attend this historic uh, event and moment, and I really, I'm really proud of that. And, uh, it, I, I, it touched my heart realizing that 50 years ago, in my home country, Sweden, I was standing up to my knees in snow, raising money to support a free and democratic South Africa. And now I'm here as a Swedish ambassador, part of this ceremony, Nobel in Africa. And uh, it's absolutely impossible to express those emotions. I can't do that. Uh, but I, I look upon myself realizing that that kid, that young boy, could never ever imagine this journey. And probably that's also the story of Stias. We don't know what kind of journey that you have started here in these noble talks in Africa because you have started that journey. And when they will write the, first, the history of the first 50 Nobel talks, 50 years to come or 25 years to come, all of us in this room are part of that history. So uh, you have started something that is really, really amazing. And you should really be proud of it, everyone in this room. And of course, as a Swede, I must recognize the laureates already done by my Swedish friend here, uh, Abit and, and, and Esther, uh, who is also part of the Nobel exhibit that we have outside of this room. So you can see photos of them and you, you can take photos of them together with you and exhibit. <laughs> That's really meta. Uh, I just want to share with you that for, 
For a decade now, decade now, Sweden has been among the top three uh, countries in global ranking when it comes to innovation. But a century ago, a century ago, we were among the poorest countries in the world. And how did that shift come to place? How, what changed that from being among the poorest to be among the richest, most innovative? Well, the answer to that question is actually present in this room. That is bringing people together, tearing down silos, bringing academia, research, science, policymakers, universities together to share knowledge and experiences, talk to each other, listen to each other even more than we are talking. I spent so much time in, in politics, 23 years in Swedish parliament, and trust me when I tell you that most politicians are most interested in talking, not listening. But I'm so convinced that we will learn more from each other if we spend more time listening to others than just talk by yourself. That's why my, my speech will be very short to you. Telling you that what you're doing now is shaping the future to the better. Because bringing you together under the same roof, listening, sharing knowledge, experiences, thoughts, ideas, we strengthen everyone in the room. And then we take that knowledge with us where we are on a daily basis. And then we share that with colleagues. And then this skill and knowledge will grow. That's why Nobel in Africa is so unique and so important to so many. And the journey has just started. Alfred Nobel was an inventor, entrepreneur, but also a very romantic man from Sweden. He wrote poetry. He spoke so many languages. At the age of 13, he was fluent in Swedish, Russian, French, English, and German. Why he could communicate with like-minded globally. And uh, that's also part of the success story, that we are not locking the doors, that we open up the doors to everyone and talk to as many as possible from other countries, other cultures, other backgrounds, and share our knowledge and experiences. So I just want to take this written speech away and tell you all how humble I am being here representing my country, Sweden, how deeply impressed I am by Stias, how proud I am with a special relation between Stias and Sweden, my country, how very proud I am that Nobel in Africa is taking place, and uh, how touched I am by my heart that 50 years ago I was raising money together with so many others in my country, Sweden. Everyone, in churches, workplaces, in schools. In school, we baked cookies that we sold to our parents, and that money was sent to liberation movement in South Africa. So I was a baker at the age of 12, <laughs> funding democracy in South Africa. And now I'm here as an ambassador. This is a really true proud moment for me. Thank you all for being here, thank you. Thank you very, very much. And on that note, on, on like you just said, the, it's often more important to just listen. One of my favorite quotes is, we have one mouth and two ears for that reason. You need to listen twice as much as what you speak. And I think that's always something that I remember each and every day as I go through life. Now, you know, I speak so many different languages. So allow me to now say welcome and welcome and welcome to our symposium conveners. Let's welcome to the stage Jakob Svensson, Stockholm University, and Rulof Berger, Stellenbosch University. They need to fight out who needs to speak. We'll see, we'll see how this goes. Good morning, uh, everyone. Great to uh, see so many people here. So uh, fortunately, the main event starts in uh, three minutes, uh, giving me just a few seconds to finish up my uh, speech, uh, which suits me perfectly, actually. 
So uh, I thought uh, I'll take uh, a little bit of time uh, to say a few words about the Nobel Symposium. Uh, not the least, because this one is indeed very special and, and, and very glamorous, I should add. So, uh, in economics, uh, these Nobel symposiums have been organized since the 1990s. Uh, and they have, or well, they serve uh, several uh, uh, objectives. Uh, one, of course, is to provide information to the prize committee, economic prize committee. But another one, an important uh, educational uh, uh, goal, uh, is an important educational goal. And that's the very reason why uh, all these sessions will be uh, video recorded and later made uh, available for uh, researchers and students across the globe. In addition, uh, we have asked uh, one member of the scientific committee to uh, put together a summary of all the sessions and provide some uh, uh, personal reflections based on that summary. And also that summary will be made uh, available to everyone after the symposium. So the uh, themes or fields of the symposiums, uh, of course, differ uh, year by year. So last year in economics, uh, the theme was on networks. Uh, next year, it will be on international trade. And the decision to select the themes or topics rest with uh, the Nobel Foundation, with the main decision criteria being uh, that this is an area where they believe uh, important development or discoveries have been made over the last decade or uh, so. So while the themes differ across years, there are uh, other aspects that are basically the same. Uh, and one is the main objective, namely to uh, identify de developments or uh, main discoveries that have been made, uh, deepening our understanding why these discoveries or developments uh, are important for, si for society, what do they imply for policy, and crucially also uh, uh, try to identify uh, areas where we are lacking knowledge, where we need to uh, learn more. Another thing that is similar is that uh, as an organizer, uh, you try to put together uh, uh, and invite the very top researchers uh, in the uh, field. And I'm very happy to report that we have very much succeeded with that, uh, um, with that um, uh, attempt this uh, year too. Uh, and I would like to take the opportunity to thank all the presenters and discussants that are uh, here today. I uh, truly very much appreciate you taking a long trip to uh, South Africa. So uh, another thing uh, I would like to uh, mention that is that, uh, of course, an event like this is not only about the scientific, putting together a scientific program, but there are uh, many uh, other uh, aspects that are, are crucially important. So let me end by uh, thanking uh, uh, the, uh, the management team and, and staff at uh, STIAS, uh, members of the scientific and uh, local organizing committee. And uh, last but not least, uh, the co, -co uh, rule of uh, Berger. Uh, so uh, uh, rule of lost or maybe one, the draw of <laughs> who should stand here to uh, to speak, uh, maybe you should stand up now, actually. Uh, but uh, uh, <laughs> anyway, Rulof, it's it's been a it's been a journey. Uh, let's let's meet up at the bar when this is all over. Okay. <laughs> so with that, uh, thank you very much. Whew, let's see the time there. Wow, 9.31, saved by the Nobel. <laughs> oh, wow, you guys got that. I'm so pleased. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, I think we need, our sink, we need to sink our teeth into this, right? So let's get started with this opening session. We are going to open it with a discussion on poverty alleviation and social protection. Now, the chair of this discussion is Oxford University Professor of Globalization and Development and the founding director of the Oxford Martin School the world's leading center for interdisciplinary research into critical global challenges. He leads research
research groups on technological and economic change, future of work and future of development. He was previously World Bank Vice President and the group's Director of Policy and served on the World Bank Executive and other key committees. Your chair for this morning's discussion, ladies and gentlemen, Ian Golding from University of Oxford. While Ian gets comfortable, let's welcome the speaker, Oriana Bandira from the London School of Economics and Political Science. Respondent, Abhijit Banerjee from Massachusetts Institute of Technology. And respondent, Christopher Udry from Northwestern University. Ian, it's all yours. Thanks very much, Tracy. It's a pleasure and honor to be here and um, to be able to be here because of the actions of many people, but including the Swedish ambassador. I was in exile, came back to South Africa, was advisor to Nelson Mandela and ran the development bank in South Africa. I wouldn't be here if the anti-apartheid movement and solidarity around the world by so many people and so many people suffering in South Africa hadn't achieved that. So. We're here at a historic moment on a topic which could not be of greater significance, which is development and microeconomic achievements in it. We've got the evidence, we've got the great people that we want in the room, and the question now is, how do we share that information? How do we learn more rapidly? Uh, and how do we scale the achievements? Because so much still has to be done on a development, even though we've come an enormous journey. This introductory session is unusual in that it's an open session. Uh, we'll then move into sessions where it'll be just the participants, uh, but we'll have a time for a Q&A afterwards. And without further ado, I'd like to invite Oriana Bandera, uh, who's the Tony Atkinson uh, Chair of Economics at LSE. Tony Atkinson was an absolute giant uh, in economics, uh, inspiration to all of us on economics. I was a pleasure to work with him in Oxford for a while, uh, and it's wonderful to have you kicking us off in terms of getting into the substance. Thank you. Thank you. No pressure there. Thank you. Uh, so, well, let's get it started. Social protection and poverty. Uh, you start looking at social protection and you feel lost, okay? There's so many choices to make. Which way should we go? I feel a bit like that. I don't know how many of you remember this book. This is Alice in Wonderland. Uh, to me, it contains most of what you need to know to have a half decent life and make the life of those around you half decent as well. So, you know, where should I go, ask Alice? And the cat says, well, that depends a lot on where you want to go. And Alice says, well, I don't, it doesn't really matter. Then it doesn't matter which road you take. I hope that we go a bit past that with these meetings, at least to know where we want to go. Not necessarily how we get there, but at least to know where we want to go. So where do we want to get to with social protection? Well, I think the hint is in the title. We want to deal with poverty. But who needs protection? Is it the poor that need protection from society? Or is it society that needs protection from poverty? I think the answer to this question is the fundamental one. And what we've learned in uh, these last 20 years is that the answers are really intertwined. That is, by eliminating poverty, we benefit everybody in society. And I hope I'll give you some evidence of that in these 30 minutes that I have. So to begin with, you know, if we wanna know about poverty, we need to know more about the life of the poor. So there comes a point in life where you realize that your parents were right. And they tell you all the time, once you will understand that I was right. And this is my father saying that once you know Latin, you know everything that there is to know. <laughs> and indeed, you, you at least know where the word poor comes from. It comes from the combination of the Latin words that stand for little and produce. So somebody who's poor is somebody who produces little. So from the very beginning, poverty was associated 
with labor. So to understand poverty, we need to understand the jobs of the poor. And uh, for this, to this purpose, I've worked with a large team of collaborators to put together a new data set that combines all the micro, high quality, nationally representative micro databases that we have on labor, which are in this uh, incarnation are the censuses and the DHSs. Okay. And from this data set, we can start looking at how the work of the poor looks like. So we have most countries in the world, the data set covers most countries in the world, and here what I plot is who is engaged, the share of the population engaged in some form of productive activity against GDP per capita. So the first thing that you see is that in every country, starting from the poorest, to the very richest, the share of people engaged in some form of productive activity is pretty much constant. So poverty is not a matter of not working. Even more so, if you look, if you split people by wealth quintiles. Because we start this data set from the individual data, we can aggregate it however we want it. And normally you aggregate by gender, by age, and so on. We decided to aggregate by wealth. So that we look, we can compare the work of the poorest in society to the work of the richest. And you see that in poorer countries, the, the poor actually work more than the rich. Now, the fundamental difference when it comes to jobs and development is the nature of work. In most low-income countries, most people are self-employed. Our concept, our Western concept of jobs, like there is an employer that gives you a check at the end of the month, is a Western concept. And that is actually the most difficult thing for us uh, studying development, is to see the condition and the context through not through the lenses of our own experience. I think that is the most difficult thing. And by seeing this figure, you realize that 80% of people in the poorest countries in the world are self-employed. And that is more so for the poorest. So, you know, in, in our countries we think Somebody who's self-employed is somebody who wants to start an activity, an entrepreneur who has some ideas of wanting to, to do well. But if you compare the share of self-employed by wealth quintiles, you see that it is mostly the poor who are self-employed. So this makes you think that we have to tailor social protection to the type of labor. If poverty depends on the jobs that the poor do, and the jobs that the poor do is mostly self-employment, we need to understand the nature of self-employment and we have to tailor our social protection tools to the fact that people are self-employed. So what I will do in this talk is I will present some new evidence in the last 10 years or so what we know about self-employment. These are not papers that deal with social protection directly. Okay? These are not evaluations of social protection. But rather, these are papers that tell us what are the constraints, what are the challenges that poor self-employed people in low-income countries face. And from this, we should learn how to adapt social protection to their needs. And then in the second part, I will go below self-employment. That is, I will talk about the people who are too poor to be self-employed, because you can go even lower. This is the bottom 5 to 10% of society. They're known as the ultra-poor, among other things. And we'll see what social protection can do for them. So let me start from the beginning, which is always a good place to start, and, and tell you that most people who are self-employed don't want to be self-employed. 
they're not there running their business, dreaming one day to have, uh, you know, selling, uh, say, pancakes by the street, dreaming one day to have a huge multinational producing pancakes all over the world. That's not the case. Most people do self-employment because that's the only thing they can do. Okay? So Arthur Lewis, a long, long time ago, came up with this, uh, this theory of with unlimited supplies of labor. And today, we have evidence that that's indeed the case. This is a clever paper by Emily and Supreet, who are somewhere here, Supreet, and uh, I saw Emily earlier, and Yujita is not here, but, but it's a very clever paper. Because what they do is that they go into Indian villages, and they see, as we've seen in the data, that most people are self-employed. So in order to understand whether that's their first choice, they create jobs themselves. They hire people. And they do it at scale. They hire about 25% of the workforce, or the available workforce in these villages. Their point is to see how the wage reacts, to see whether there is excess supply. But what they see in the process is that most people leave their self-employment business to take on this wage job, even if it's temporary. So the demand for a job that pays a wage is quite strong. This is directly relevant for public work schemes. Right? One major tool in the self-employment arsenal are public works. And when you do public works, a lot of people join. But I think one can be more creative and think of coordinating with other public programs. For instance, the government needs agents in rural communities to deliver public services. So it could basically um, achieve both aims, to give jobs to people in the rural communities and deliver the public programs by hiring from the communities themselves. We saw an example of this in a paper with my co-author, Nava Ashraf, who's also here. <laughs> and um, there what we saw was that the government of Zambia hired people from the communities and trained them as nurses and sent them back to the communities of origin. Contrary to the standard model where you take people from the center and send them out and they run away as soon as they can, this model was quite successful in creating, um, in creating a cadre of local medical officers but nurses, more than, medic not more than doctors, but starting from nothing is a good. And more importantly, this created a feedback. This, uh, we're studying now the feedback loop by showing the residents of the community how education can lead to a career with the government. Education can find you a job. So starting from a situation in which the only option in these communities is to be a self-employed farmer, the fact that the government hires from the community and you can get a job as a government paid nurse will generate, hopefully, incentives for more education and, and then start a positive feedback mechanism. Now, the fact that people do not want Self-employed people do not really want to be self-employed can explain other facts in the development literature. So by now, one stylized fact is that a lot of programs which have been designed to make firms grow do not work. Now, we've thrown everything at this. We've thrown business training, accounting training, um, management training, consulting of every type, free labor, free capital, grants, nothing. Firms st remain stubbornly small. There is a simple explanation, which is that people don't want to grow a firm. They're really waiting to find a job. This makes it very difficult for young workers to find jobs because firms do not hire. And even highly subsidized interns are really hard to place. 
if you look at all the evaluation of internship programs, there is a number which nobody focuses on, which I think is very important, which is the take-up rate. The take-up rate is ridiculously low. In, in that paper, we compare vocational training with internships, and vocational training does a lot better. And the take-up is a lot stronger, that is, if you give people vocational training, they take it. Whereas if you try to get people into firms as interns, it's actually quite difficult. So investment in vocational training seems to be an important part to get people good jobs. Now, the second piece of evidence, which I think is very important, is the nature of entrepreneurship is such that you bear a lot of risk, but cannot afford to pay insurance. Now, there's an ongoing theme in this uh, literature which sees some puzzles, right? it sees farmers exposed to a lot of risk, and say, why don't they just get insurance? Insurance is there, it can be bought. Well, yes, it can be bought, but the moment you have to pay the premium is precisely when you have no money. So you want to transfer risk across states, but you're asked to transfer money across time, which then meets the constraints in the, label, in the credit market because you can't borrow money if you don't have any. That's the other genius idea of credit markets. You can only borrow money if you have some already. So insurance premium need to be paid in advance, often in the slack season, and that's what stops people. It's not that they're stupid. They don't know that they have to take insurance. They know. And indeed, a recent experiment by Lorenzo uh, Casaburi, who's here, and Jack Wills, shows that take-up goes up from 5 to 72% when you just shift the timing of the premium. So when people can afford the insurance, they buy it. Now, understanding risk and fitting in risk into social protection is very important also because with the climate change, the poorest are really more exposed to risk. And when they have no way of coping with risk, what they do is that they curtail investment. So if they have a pot of funds that they can use for investment or for saving, when they cannot insure themselves through the market, they invest less and keep some savings for a non-rainy day. So we see this in, uh, in Bangladesh. That's a new paper that beats every record for number of co-authors. Uh, we take the advice of sharing knowledge very seriously, and we have these huge teams. I can't tell you how the Zoom calls are. Uh, and, uh, and there is evidence, uh, again, from Bangladesh with, um, in that paper there. Now, there are ways out of this. There are conditional loans, conditional on the state of the world. So one of my favorite papers in economics, and also one of the first papers I read was by Chris, who showed how in Nigeria, households effectively use loans as a form of risk sharing. You repay when you can. When you can't, you don't. So essentially, this is insurance without a premium, which is ideal for those who cannot afford premium. In the paper before, by, by Greg Lane, the, the, he documents an attempt at uh, uh, using conditional loans for floods. So this is a loan which is immediately available to all of the borrowers for this NGO when the flood gouge goes above a certain level. So it doesn't depend on their circumstances, but if the floods get really bad, the NGO gives you a loan on a favorable rate. Now, the really tricky thing, and the beautiful thing about this, and the tricky thing about this, is that having the loan makes it look like it's not needed. Because the idea that the loan is there means that they do not withhold investment. Because they know if things go bad, they can borrow. So they invest. Because they have invested, they don't need to borrow. So it looks like the loan is not needed. And indeed, in this particular case, it was discontinued. Whereas the non-use of the loan is actually 
a symptom of his success. You don't have to look at whether the loan is used, you have to look at whether people are doing better when the loan is in place. And that's what the line paper shows. Right? So these type of loans are also not used for the extremely poor for fear that they will not repay. But again, in reality, it acts really as a safety net. Because it's there, people invest, and because they invest, they're not going to need the loan. So I think more should be done in understanding whether these are feasibly usable as social protection tools. Uh, next problem, which is linked to the risk exposure, is liquidity constraints. Basically doing a, a review of papers of everybody in the room, so this is Kelsey, uh, who shows that when people, farmers in this case, in Africa, um, sorry, I should be more precise, in Zambia, don't have enough resources to survive during the slack season, what they do is that they sell their labor to large landowners. But that means that they neglect their own fields. Okay? And by neglecting their own fields, they become less productive, which makes the problem worse for the next season. Okay? A simple loan that funds consumption smoothing basically can stop this downward spiral. Again, it's a matter of time. In six months, they will have enough resources. You just need them to bridge this period. So universal basic income, for instance, a recent paper by Abhijit and others have shown, reduces the need for liquidity and increases the bargaining power versus, of the poor versus the large landowners, thus increasing wages. So that is one possible solution to the problem. So in summary, we see that the poor are in these jobs which are seasonal, uncertain, and particularly exposed to climate change because of the uh, large share of agricultural employment. So in combination with poorly functioning insurance and credit market, this lead to actions, to them being forced to take actions which offer immediate respite, that is, food on the table, at the price of future losses of productivity, which then will force them to take more of these inefficient actions, which basically creates a downward spiral out of which is really hard to get. It is very important to see this link between poverty and efficiency, between poverty and productivity. The poor are not unproductive because they are poor. They are poor because of, the because being, uh, of the, uh, low productivity. That is, they know what to do. Once you offer them loans, the take up is super high and they don't go work for the landowners. They stay on their own fields and they create surplus, which is more than enough to repay the loan. Uh, when you offer, in the risk and insurance experiment, when you offer to pay the premium when they have the money as opposed to when they don't, they buy the insurance. So it's no matter of not knowing or not understanding. It's not, they're not poor because they do not know. They are poor because they do not have the means to do what they know is right. Now, if you thought that that was a bad situation, this is actually worse. We go below the self-employed, and we look at the life of the poorest of the poor. To be self-employed, you need a minimum level of capital. Right? If you have a small shop, you need the premises. You need, maybe if you're selling free food, you need a fridge to store the food. If you don't have even that low level of capital, you end up engaging in casual labor. Casual labor has all the features of self-employment in the sense that it is irregular, seasonal, but it's paid even less and you have no control over when to work because you work whenever jobs are available. And when jobs are available, you work long hours and when jobs are not available, you don't work at all. Right? 
So this is the story of a, a program which has come to be known as graduation, and it was designed by the NGO BRAC, and I know about it because I was involved in the evaluation of it. So the idea here was to help the poorest women in the poorest villages of Bangladesh. Mostly these are widows. There's no male earner in the household. They're all illiterate. They're all well below the then 190 the poverty line. And they're all employed in casual jobs. In this setting, casual jobs are either working as a servant in the houses of richer people in the village, or working as a worker in the field. But again, for richer landowners, whenever the landowners feel like they need somebody. Brack gave them a cow and taught them how to take care of it. Okay? Why cow? Actually, to be absolutely fair, Brack didn't give them a cow. He offered them a menu of self-employment opportunities, among which there was livestock rearing. But everybody took up livestock rearing. Why is that? We think it's because that is the most common occupation among the richer women in these villages. But that's, the program is not just that. The program has a lot of components based on the idea that the poorest of the poor are actually subject to constraints on multiple dimensions, and that you cannot address their problem unless you tackle all these dimensions at the same time. This is a bit of an admission of ignorance. We don't know which of these constraints is really binding. Most importantly, we don't know how they interact. So there is some work uh, by most people in this room uh, done to try and see which of the components is really needed. Whether you take one away, the program still works as well. And this is very important work, which has had some findings, but I think still, as of today, we don't know how to disentangle which of these uh, constraints bind and whether they bind jointly. So this is our evaluation, our sample design. Uh, we followed these people for a long time, and we have another round planned uh, for, for uh, like next year. So in 2007, we ran a census of these areas where the program operates, and we take 100,000 households, which is the universe of households, and from there we draw a sample of 20,000, more or less. These 20,000 are of every social class. They're not just the ultra poor. And then we follow them for that period. Uh, the program is randomly um, placed in half of the villages in 2007, and then in 2000, after 2011, actually closer to 2013, BRAC also treated the control villages. The idea, so one of the big challenges of um, randomized control trials is to withhold good treatments from the control group, because in order to know whether it works, you do need to have a control group. So many evaluations are just based on a staggered rollout. So you do not deprive the control group from the program. You just keep them untreated for a period of time, the time that it takes to evaluate. Now, this was uh, five years, in this case, five to six years. And in any case, BRAC couldn't have treated everybody at the same time. So in the evaluation, we show that this is our sample. It's very important to see this because it reflects what I was telling you earlier, that most people are self-employed and that the level of poverty in these areas is really, really high. So if you look at the ultra-poor households, they are female-led in 40% of the case, 93% of them are illiterate, they're all very poor, they don't have any productive assets. So the program really is a shock to their productive possibilities. What do we find? We find that they 
like the farmers who take the loan, the farmers who take the insurance, they, they know what to do. They know this is good for them. So they take on the livestock, they drop their casual jobs, and they start a livestock business. Income consumption and savings especially all increase. The increase is sustained over time. And we find also, however, that it doesn't work for everybody because there are the people at the very bottom of the asset distribution for whom this is not enough. The, the, those remain trapped in poverty. Now, these graduation programs have taken the world by storm. NGOs and government are all implementing them. Uh, there is a belief that actually you can do it on the cheap. You can cut down the cost. The BRAC program was quite costly. It was $1,000 per household. Of course, that is not a, an attractive um, trait in a program. People want to do things that are cheap. But unfortunately, when the, program, when the problem is big, a small solution doesn't do much. But I want to make this point to, to make clear why there is this confusion. And the, the problem is as follows. In order to measure poverty, we use data on consumption because income is really difficult to measure in self-employment activities in, uh, in low-income countries. So consumption is okay, especially for the poor, because they live a subsistence. So consumption is a good proxy for income. But that is true only when they are at their equilibrium. That is, when things are business as usual. When they are changing, so when you give them a big transfer, Consumption is not necessarily a good measure because what they can do is to save part of it, even to consume less in order to invest and have much higher income in future periods. Right? If I were to give you universally here an extra $10, you probably just go buy yourself a coffee. If you are here, maybe you can buy a coffee for a friend. If you're in Boston, probably you need another $10 to buy a coffee. <laughs> but you're going to consume those $10. If I give you $100,000, you're going to think better. You're going to think, well, maybe I put some on the side. Maybe I buy a house for my kids. Maybe I invest them. So this is what we see. If we look at, at this is a sample of each dot here is an estimate from a paper that evaluates a cash transfer or uh, a productive asset transfer, and you see that, uh, so on the horizontal axis, we have how big the transfer is relative to the household consumption. So 0.2 means it's worth 20% of the household budget. And on the vertical axis, what I put is the impact on consumption divided by the size of the transfer. That is, what percentage of the transfer you eat. Okay? And you see that the smaller transfers are almost entirely eaten. So if you evaluate a program after two years, it looks the same whether you give people $10 or $100,000 because they consume $10 out of it. But the big program has savings and later investments. Okay? I'm uh, running out of time, so I just conclude by saying that I think what we've learned, there is much more. Unfortunately, what you learn by doing this job is that you know a lot less than you thought you could ever know. So there is a lot more to be done, but I think what we've learned from all this evidence is that we need to protect society from poverty. That is, reducing poverty is not just good and a moral thing to do for those directly affected by it, but it unleashes the productive potential of everybody in the village, in the country, in the world. Thank you very much, Ariana. That was a really tremendous, succinct uh, summary of where we are, what we know, and uh, 
brilliantly done and ended, um, and uh, reflects also your your deep respect of the data as a co-editor of Econometric, amongst others. Um, our discussant is the 2019 co-recipient of the Nobel Prize in Economics, um, together with Esther de Flo and Michael Kramer, uh, co-founder of JPAL, which really has been at the forefront globally of teaching us how to uh, respect the data and do the work that is so much the theme of, of this symposium. Uh, Abhijit, the floor is yours. Um, well, thank you. Um, and thank you, Oriana, for that uh, amazingly wide-ranging uh, description of the kind of uh, work that's happened. I, I want to mostly uh, s slightly supplement what you said rather than, um, I, I mostly agree, so I uh, would, wouldn't waste my time trying to find small points of disagreement. Uh, I, I, maybe a, a good way to start is to sort of change, use the words that Oriya was using, but in reverse. To say, instead of talking about downward spirals, talk about upward spirals. And I think a lot of her story is actually about upward spirals. That, in a sense, in the world, despite the fact that you know very poor people often have many disadvantages, we we now have a cumulative evidence of at least the possibility of upward spirals. And that, I think, is uh, fundamental for the reason that uh, Oriana emphasized well, that uh, it changes our perspective on what poverty is. I think uh, when I started um, as an economist, I, I, there was a, a code word that economists often use, and it was, it was um, you know, we are economists. It was called, it's all about the excess. Excess are really kind of a code word of saying the poor are stupid or incompetent or lazy, and therefore they don't. They, those are their excess, their characteristics, and that's what makes them poor. And I think what we've learned, I think, quite uh, I think convincingly, in the last uh, 30 years, I would say, uh, is, is that I mean, it's clear that, of course, there are different people. Some people are more energetic than others. Many people are more energetic than me uh, on any given day. Uh, but I, within that, there is huge variation among people's uh, what, uh, what, um, even very poor people can achieve with very limited resources. And that's, that's uh, the, and that it, what makes the, a lot of that variation uh, come about is the fact that they are, they face uh, what uh, I think Oriana was alluding to, uh, just a litany of different social constraints that they don't, they, for them, life is a series of challenges, not of their making, uh, result of the way the market function, results of the way that in institutions function, result of the way, way that society views people like them. So a lot, lot, of, the, uh, lot of the evidence is suggests that when you, when, you, when you relieve those constraints, a multiplicity of mechanisms come into play. And the, re the upward spiral, there's just not one upward spiral, there are many upward spirals. And what I wanted to kind of maybe spend my time talking about is kind of the variety of these upward spirals. Uh, let me give you an example that's very different from uh, Oriana's, but uh, also an upward spiral. E you, education is, uh, there's uh, Pascaline and Esther, uh, were involved in work in Ghana, uh, which w provided uh, e education, a free scholarship to girls to go to school. And the one generation of then girls, the now young women, went to school. If you look at the next generation, you start to see that that has effects on the learning capacity and the learning of their children. And that that's, 
So in other words, and these children will therefore be able to take better advantage of the educational opportunities available to them than, than they would have otherwise. So in some sense, there is a, the, this idea of upward spirals is pervasive. It's not just about, you know, getting the cow and moving on from the cow. And indeed, in, in, uh, we, we did a similar study to the one that Oriana mentioned in India. And one of the things you see is that, yes, the cow, uh, exactly like uh, Oriana said, the cow changed people's livelihoods. They started making more money. What did, what did they do with that money? Well, the first thing they did was, well, they maybe bought some more cows or goats uh, in this case. And, but very soon, they moved on to other things. The, the, their money uh, opened opportunities. They started non-farming businesses, which means they were, they were making money from whatever, a small shop or vending things or sell, uh, going from house to house and selling, selling trinkets and things like that. So they, they did that for a while. Then the next thing they did was their, for their uh, now grown-up children, they started creating opportunities. What kind of opportunities do they create? If you look at the control group in our experiment, very similar experiment to the one she described, the control group, the children, when they grow up, they go looking for jobs elsewhere, but they go jo looking for jobs nearby. When the parents have more money, the children go further. They go uh, to more distant cities where there are better opportunities, and they make more money from that. So uh, the, in, after 10 years, the big effect of the program is actually on the migration earnings of the next generation. So in other words, it's not one trap, which is you, know, you pop them and they stay there. It's a series of traps, and it's, uh, I think what makes me optimistic is the fact that once you release one of these constraints, then in principle, that can drive other, other uh, relaxations and other, other uh, gains. The, the, I, and I think the mechanism, I mean, that's highlighting the fact that it, it's, it's not simply this um, one, uh, and I'm, uh, of course, Oriana didn't imply that, but it's not the fact that it's that one constraint you relax, and then that stays relaxed. The relaxation of that constraint can open up opportunities for relaxing other constraints. And that's, that's what gives me uh, you know, ho hope for this agenda. That in, but in principle, all these interventions are complementary. You, you, you get gains from, you get gains from uh, the fact that, uh, you know, you, you have an asset, you, the asset earns an income, you spend that on the education of your children, you spend that on, the, on buying insurance uh, when, when you need it, you spend that on, on uh, sending your children to a di more distant city to earn a, earn a better living. You, the different families will adopt diff different strat strategies there. And I think one of the implications of that is that we, we, are, we, we need to be more open to the idea that we don't know which of these different mechanisms we're going to trip, trip off for any individual. That, and and that's, that's, that humility is critical uh, in thinking about the design of policy. Because in uh, some sense, it's, uh, if we knew that, and, uh, that it, for these households, it's, once we give them more credit, everything will be better, and that was sort of the presumption, if you like, of microcredit. Uh, that whole movement around microcredit was built on this idea that credit is a, the primary driver. And I think if you look at the evidence on that, is that it, you find that I credit is important. People do many things with credit. Many people uh, use it to improve their lives in ways that all of us would, meaning they buy televisions, they buy refrigerators, they buy motorbikes, they repair their house. It doesn't make them richer. And uh, the, I think that for most people, credit, turns out, doesn't actually raise their earnings. It makes them 
no doubt better off, they want it, but it doesn't necessarily make them better off. And that, that diverse, but on the other hand, uh, and this is work that Esther and I did with Emily and Cynthia Kinnan, uh, there's a small fraction of the people, maybe 5%, maybe 10%, who do use that credit and expand their businesses. And for those people, the expansion is massive. So the, it's not that credit is not important. It's just that people are different. People have different perceptions of how they want to organize their lives. And because they have these different perceptions, you, 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 we need to need design social programs which are not based on some one particular theory. What, that's, what I'm trying to suggest here is that I think we, we especially in, in contexts where we are relatively ignorant about the, you know, what the specific constraint of a particular household faces. And often, I think, the, the beautiful example of, of uh, Lorenzo and Jack's paper that uh, Oriana mentioned is often, it's not even that we don't understand the, we, we don't understand the big problem, we don't even understand the fi where the fine details of, when we think we understand the problem, we don't understand the fine details of it. For example, in same insurance, sold at a different time might have very different implications. So in some sense, given that level of our, I think, uh, alas, I would say, ignorance, I think, and on the other hand, combined with the fact that we do know now that fixing these problems sort of in general has large beneficial effects, uh, I think it gives us I suggest that maybe we should move towards more uh, sort of more broad based programs, giving people uh, maybe maybe assets, maybe maybe uh, income. So more more. I don't want to say universal basic income because it may well be that you know most countries can't afford universal basic income, but some form of of transfers that are more uh, less. Uh, you know, institutionalized, less through, uh, you know, this is going to help you get insurance, this one's going to help you get credit, this one's going to help you get education, uh, more unlabeled transfers which are, uh, which people will use in different ways. Maybe, maybe an implication of all of this uh, narrative is that we, we need to be more open-minded about, you know, how the money will be used. Um, we, uh, Tavneet uh, Suri is sitting at the back, uh, Paul Niehaus um, and I and, uh, and others, uh, we, we, we're, we're involved in an evaluation of a universal basic income. In this case, it was universal uh, basic income program in, in Kenya. And I think one of the things that, uh, that highlighted was, again, that, you know, you see uh, the, the response to the, to the transfers were diverse. People, some, some people uh, started businesses, others repaired their house, others. And for all of them, I, I feel our presumption should be that they did something fairly sensible. I think one of the reassuring pieces of evidence is that it's not, people do different things with transfers, but very few people do stupid things with them. I think that's, they don't stop working. If anything, labor supply, uh, when you make transfers, labor supply goes up rather than down, but certainly not down. We have, we have so people don't stop working because they have a little bit of money. Uh, they make, you know, variety of other cho uh, life choices, but we see n no, uh, I think, very credible evidence that they are, for example, having lots more parties or uh, drinking more or, or the, I, I, I think many of you smile, but in fact, very much. And uh, the, the, the implication of the, uh, you know, the literature has always been that you should, shouldn't trust the poor to do, uh, do with money because they will misbehave in one form or another. Why else would they be poor is the implication, I think. And so I, th I think that there is, I, I think this idea that we therefore uh, need to be, a, uh, I think a little, we, I think the evidence now is there. We don't need to, there's also I think lots of randomized control trials on this question of should you give people in cash or kind? 
because in kind you give them the food, they, then they eat it, so somehow the theory. It makes no difference. You, the, roughly, unless food is really scarce in some place, you give them food, they give them money, they eat the same amount. Um, so all of that saying maybe that we, we could be a little less directive, a little more open to the idea that we make, uh, make transfers to people and let them make the best judgment of how to use it. Uh, and then, uh, then it comes to you know, how much and in what form. And there, I think, again, what Oriana said, I'm going to echo. We, we have a little bit of evidence f in Kenya from that study I just mentioned with Abneet, uh, which is that when you give them the same amount of money, either as, you know, monthly transfers for two years or a, l a single lump sum, more or less, at the beginning, the single lump sum is used m much more to start businesses than the same amounts of money. So again, maybe trust them more, don't give them all the money. Uh, all of that seems to be sort of actually easier, less, less bureaucratically complicated. And uh, I think if the evidence, my reading of the evidence now, of course, we, might, we will learn more, uh, is that that's, that's uh, a, a relatively uh, that, that, that we can be relatively optimistic about that particular direction. So well, thank you. Thank you for having me. Thanks, uh, Abhijit, for that uh, very, very uh, helpful and uh, insightful response. Um, and uh, the takeaway, no magic bullets, but we do know a lot and uh, trust people. Um, the great thing about this symposium is one could not wish for better people uh, to be in the room uh, and to be discussing. So I'm absolutely delighted uh, to welcome uh, Chris Udry, the second discussant. Chris is at Northwestern, Fort uh, King Professor of uh, uh, Economics, also co-founder, director of the Global Poverty Lab there, and done a tremendous amount of work uh, in this region. So uh, Chris, over to you. Thank you very much. Um, so thank you, Oyana and, and Abhijit. Um, it, it turns out that we agree. Um, we, know, we know less than we think. Um, I, I, wasn't, I wasn't sure that we would, we would totally agree on this. Um, I, I was tempted to say, I know less than I thought, but I'm, I'm projecting, and I'm, I'm guessing it's true for all of us. Um, so, over the past 20 years, it's been stunning to be a development economist. We've learned so much. Um, we've, we've, we've seen a blossoming of, of credible estimates of causal effects of programs and a wide variety of interventions in many different contexts and superb work understanding economic organization. I really liked Oriana's focus on when we're trying to understand poverty alleviation, you need to understand poverty and what's driving it and, and what are the causes of it. And we've learned a lot about that. Um, but we're just constantly concerned about the problem of external validity. We find out what's going on in one place. What does that tell us about what's going on in another place or even the same place at a different time? The, ch the challenge is posed by the, the very apparent heterogeneity in treatment effects and behaviors across space and across time. Um, so I, I do a lot of my work on agriculture, and, and so maybe I'm a little bit biased because it, it may be that the heterogeneity is just more apparent in agriculture than in, than in other parts of, of life. Um, Tavneet, uh, Surya and I have, a, have edited the, uh, a, a review, uh, which just, just came out like this week. Um, uh, which highlights the, the amount of heterogeneity in, in the, the usefulness of different types of agricultural technology across Africa. Um, building in large part on her early work documenting important heterogeneity across farmers in, in the productivity of improved seeds and fertilizer in Kenya. Um, uh, another example from a, re a recent great paper in the Journal of Development Economics um, about how important soil variation is within small villages in Malawi and how important that is for farmers' decisions about agricultural technologies that they're going to 
to use. Or one of my favorite papers, um, which is about seaweed farmers, which I hadn't known anything about before. Uh, but it turns out that it really matters how big your, your, your seed of seaweed is and, and how that varies across very small regions. Um, and, and Mark Rosenzweig and I showed shockingly that weather matters for, for um, how, how well you do in, in agriculture. Um, in, in fact, th this is one of my favorite graphs from the paper. If, 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 if we had done an RCT to measure the returns to investment in farming in a really good year, we would have been really certain that the return, this, is, this blue line is the, the standard, the, it's the distribution of our estimates for, for how productive, productive agriculture is in a, in a good year. And this red line is our beliefs about how, 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 what the rate of return to investment in agriculture would have been in a bad year. And so if we happened to do our study in a good year, we were really optimistic. If we did it in a bad year, it would have been a disaster. If you sort of average that over time, it turns out this is our distribution of beliefs about how productive or how, um, how high the return would be to investment in agriculture. And it turns out we just, we don't know. It could be anything. It could be hugely negative. It could be hugely positive. It just depends. Um, so this is a disaster. Um, um, how do we generalize in the face of this? Well, one way is to expand the scope of our investigations, to make what was external, internal. Um, so if we, if we do this enough, in enough places, in enough different contexts, we'll see, we'll know whether it works in this context or that context. Um, this, is, this, is, this is replication. This is, this is the idea behind IPA at the beginning. Uh, let's, let's try these things um, and, in many places and, and see, see how it works. Um, this is why we do meta-analyses. Um, we use statistical methods to try to generalize across, across space. Um, so that's one way we can, we can generalize about this. Um, another way we can generalize is to tell stories. Um, we can make models about it. Um, that's what we really like. <laughs> Um, so, uh, thinking about generalizing by, by making the external internal, by, by, by broadening our scope, uh, that was one of the ideas behind this, this uh, series of coordinated studies of graduation programs across several different countries at the same time, so we could look at the same or similar programs across many different places, and, and try to see where it works, where it doesn't. Can we, can, we, can we be confident that these graduation programs that both Oriana and Abhiji spoke about, do they work? Um, and for some types of programs, for, for certain kinds of interventions, uh, more formal meta-analysis may be possible. Um, you know, so for example, um, Dean and I are working on a meta-analysis of, of of entrepreneurship programs, you know, trying to, trying to Im improve people's businesses, which, as Oriana noted, doesn't seem to work all that well all the time. Um, but, you know, so we've, we've got 47 studies of 54 sites, 120,000 businesses. We can, we can look across space and try to see if different types of programs work, different other types of programs don't. These are just a little graph of our current estimates of how well um, these programs work. And uh, it, it, it looks like, for example, um, programs that provide both capital and guidance on how to use that capital um, are, are, are less dispersed in their outcomes than programs that just give away capital or programs that just provide advice. Um, but I wouldn't, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't count on these estimates, but this is the sort of thing we could do. Um, uh, for certain common policies or programs, lessons from meta-analysis seem like they're going to be coming soon. Um, they're, they're, they're going to be more and more reliable. Um, we're, we're, we're working on a study of a meta-analysis of 73 cash transfer programs, um, 114 studies. Um, to, to make these meta-analyses work, you need strong statistical assumptions, which I don't really believe. Um, and, but most importantly, the density, you need a high density of work. You need a lot of, of research. And the density of research is just orders of magnitude of smaller 
than we would need to use this method to understand most programs and how they affect poverty. Um, it's just literally an order of magnitude less than what we need. And moreover, the work is really maldistributed across Africa. Um, it, you know, some of you people are responsible for this dark. Um, um, uh, so there's plenty of, plenty of research in Kenya, you know, lots of research in Ghana, lots of research in Southern Africa, but nobody's going to Chad. Um, and, and so this lack, this, this, this really means it's gonna be, th this type of method isn't gonna help us a lot um, in a lot of places. Um, and the, a lot of this has to do with the poor representation of African authors in the field. The answer is yes, economics has an Africa problem, but that's, that's for another day. Um, so um, what I tend to mostly rely on and what I think most of us tend to rely on are stories um, when we're trying to generalize from our work. This is a general issue it's a, and a general approach. It's irrelevant if we're talking about an RCT or a specific program evaluation or other kind of basic research. The question is, how do we generalize from what we find in one specific space? Um, how, drawing policy lessons from any one body of literature requires a model of how the heterogeneity that we know exists affects that behavior or that um, program. It's not clear at first, at least to me, most of the time, when I'm doing a study or have finished a study, how to think about that generalization process. This is hard. Um, I, I, so I'm gonna provide a couple of instances from my own work, um, just because um, it's sort of embarrassing sometimes, but I suspect all of us could do this. Um, um, so one of, I, I had a paper where I, I found strong evidence that women farmers produce much less on their farms than their husbands did on similar farms. That's just a graph of it, doesn't it? Um, and so my conclusion from that was that, well, households don't work as smoothly as we might have thought. The efficient household models, it's the foundation of a lot of our ideas about how households work, wasn't right. Uh, women are discriminated against within the household for reasons that I didn't understand. Um, I, I found something similar in southern Ghana um, in, in Aquapim, uh, a, a decade or so later. Um, here, uh, I was familiar enough with the area and we were able to do enough field research to understand that the reason women were, f and in fact, this, this was, women told me um, that the reason that they're farming less, they're getting less out of their farms than their husbands was because it could be traced to their lack of connections to local political power. Um, which, which led them to have less security and tenure on their, on their land, which meant that they couldn't fallow it without fearing losing it, which lowered their productivity. And so now I'm starting to understand why um, households were operating in the way they were. But more recently, I work with, with, with Dean and, and Lori Beeman in Mali, where we just randomized cash grants to men and women. Um, we find again, deep frictions within that household, lack of efficiency. And, um, but in this case, it turns out that it has to do with the patrilocal extended family and the labor obligations that men have. Um, these dots are households in a survey and the boxes are their extended family. And depending upon the position of their household within the extended family, that shaped the, the way that uh, resources were allocated within the household. Um, the story now is that the efficient household model is insufficiently rich in many contexts, but I can't take what happens in Aquapim and expect it to apply to what's happening in Mali. We've got to understand what the source of the friction is in any particular place. Um, in, in, in northern Nigeria, I found that state contingent insurance payments were embedded within, within uh, loans, informal loans within villages. And the story there was that flexible financial markets supported by community-based enforcement 
enable people to write insurance contracts to, to protect each other against idiosyncratic risk. In northern Ghana, on the other hand, what we found was that when we provided uh, folks with rainfall index insurance, um, they really needed it. They, they, they were, they, it. It really affected their behavior. And they were, if, I, if we gave people access to this insurance, they were able to find the resources to invest more in their farms. And so they, when, they, when they wanted to invest more in their farms, they could find the resources. There were intertemporal mechanisms that they could use to, to invest when they wanted to, when they had insurance. But neighboring Burkina Faso, when people are facing droughts and, and, and aggregate shocks to their income, the, the, their consumption tracks their income really tightly. There's no evidence in these villages in Burkina Faso of insurance against aggregate risk or even insurance against idiosyncratic risks during these downturns, nor any, any evidence of, of, of a strong ability to smooth resources over time. And so the structure of the financial markets varied dramatically between northern Nigeria, northern Ghana, and Burkina Faso, all within the same agroclimatic zone, within the same region of, of West Africa. And, and, and so this, this led to, this is, this is just mysterious. And the mysterious, the mystery got even worse um, in an in a, in a important failure to replicate, which I haven't told Dean I was going to tell you all about yet. Um, but in this, in this part of northern Ghana, where we found that in rainfall index insurance, um, people dem demanded it, and when they, when, they got, when they got access to the index insurance, they found money to invest more in their farms. Um, we, uh, the year after we gave them insurance, we sold it to them. Um, and we have this beautiful downward sloping demand curve for insurance. At the actuarially fair price for insurance, almost half the people demanded it. And so this is, this is great. Um, well, so risk matters. Farmers can put together resources for investment. In fact, they were able to buy the insurance even, even when it was sold during the time when it was, money was scarce. Um, and farmers were able to put together resources for investment when they were insured. Three years later, in the same area, we found no demand for and no impact of grants of a commercial index insurance product. And this is in northern Ghana, um, where I've been working for a long time. And we still don't understand why we're not able to replicate this. Um, it might have to do with the product design. This for-profit, this firm might have designed a, a less good product. It was a less good product. There may have been more basis risk. There may have been trust involved. Um, it may have been a change in salience having to do with weather patterns over the, over the past years. But the point is that I don't have a story about it. And that's the place where I've been working for a really long time. And so finding the right story is difficult but it's what we need in order to be able to generalize from any one specific instance to a more general um, uh, context. And so we just have to be, as Abhijit concluded, um, modesty is, is, is what we need. When we're, when we're making policy advice, we don't need to be imposing uh, what we think we know when we actually don't know very much. So thank you. Thanks very much, Chris. Um, I think the message, particularly for those um, non-economists, of which there are many in the room, uh, who always probably think of economists as being A, sort of very high level and not focused on the detail, and B, very arrogant, um, and C, incomprehensible. Uh, I think uh, my <laughs> th this panel has really done a lot, I hope, to abuse you of your uh, misconceptions. But this is the best in economics. <laughs> there are economists that do suffer from those flaws I've raised, but they're not in the room. <laughs> so um, we have about uh, 15 minutes for Q&A. Uh, just signal who you are. Is the, I think they're roving mics on there um, that can pick you up. Just say who you are and pose a question rather than a, a long comment so we have time to, <laughs> to get through quite a, quite a
quite a few. And if you want to direct a particular person, say who that person is, otherwise I'll sort of uh, distribute it. Okay. The, right in the corner there. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> Thanks so much, um, Dory Posel. It was a really wonderful session. I just want to make one comment, which is probably adds to the heterogeneity story about South Africa, is that I think one of uh, an important way in which the poor insure themselves against risk is by investing in social capital and in the social con South African context in their ancestors or the Ahmad Lawsi. So with the example of the cow, I kept on imagining, well, if it was a goat, for example, it's quite possible that the goat would be slaughtered to have a, a big gathering for the community to say thank you to the community for support and to um, appease the ancestors or to respect the ancestors. And I just wondered whether and how this kind of investment in social capital and investment in the Ahmad Lawsi would fit into a an incremental upward spiral um, uh, in the presentations today. Thanks. Okay. Um, I, I guess uh, that goes back to kind of what I was trying to say about, you know, there are just very many different strategies and those uh, people have very different ways. I, I don't see why social capital is any different. If it's really the case that, for example, uh, this gives them uh, insurance, this, uh, then that then allows them to invest. So if it is the case that the social bonds are somehow strengthened, I, there is, uh, there are some studies of kind of uh, trying to engineer uh, social capital uh, in Africa, and a number of them from about 10, 12 years ago. I think most of them failed. Uh, they tried to get people to invest in social capital. Um, I think there's one in Liberia, I remember, but there were several at the same time. I don't think there was much evidence that engineering externally sort of funded uh, opportunities to en engineer social capital, they were often useful. The social capital was often useful. They'd increase incomes, but it didn't particularly make people more cohesive. But I, I, that is not to say that we shouldn't try that. Maybe the only thing to add is to the extent that the transfer is uh, small, then if you don't see the opportunity to grow the business with that small transfer, it might be a better idea to have a party with everybody in the village. <laughs> Good. Yep. Um, hi, thank you so much for three wonderful presentations. I wanted to ask the extent to which um, there's kind of a trade-off between poverty alleviation and social protection. And you didn't touch on this, but it seems to me that a way through which there is social protection happening is through social networks and people helping each other and within the village, you know, sharing whatever they can share. And so to that extent, that may actually, you know, prevent people from investing because if I have a little bit of extra cash instead of saving it so that I can buy a cow down the road, I'm just gonna give it to the person next to me or Chris in your own work, you felt that. You know, I'm not gonna follow my land, which is an Im important productive investment because if I, if, you know, um, if I do, then my land may end up being redistributed to the poor. So the fact that there is a lot of social protection happening at the local level, you know, to what extent does it, uh, you know, uh, contribute to, you know, poverty traps in some sense? Uh, Yes, th th that is very important. Uh, but I think that if you look at the history of a successful development, every place has some local social capital. But when the incentives are strong enough, when the prospective for growth is strong enough, people do take, I think, the, the investment. And in that case, like Abhijit was saying earlier, the social network can actually be harnessed to foster the, the economic success. So I don't necessarily see networks as a drag down. I think they're a supporting net which can be lifted as, as well as. Uh, we've done other work in uh, you know, organizations in uh, higher income countries that show that people help each other out, but if one has the opportunity to earn a lot, they, they, will, they will do that, they will follow that. Want to add anything, Chris? Yeah, um, 
So I, I totally agree with the thrust of that question. And Supreet's got some interesting work right now talking about the, exactly that sort of social tax. Um, and for land tenure, you know, the, this flexible land tenure system that exists over much of, much of Africa ha has served as a stunningly successful um, device for social protection. There's no landless class. Um, and, and so it has, but at, but at the same time, it does have this dragging effect on in investment. Um, that, and I think just being aware of this tension um, makes, makes me um, trepidatious about a lot of programs to do land reform, um, land tenure reform, um, because we often can focus on the production effects as opposed to the social protection effects. And so we have to keep them both in mind. Person over here? Yeah. <laughs> uh, just wait for the mic. Hi, thank you for the panel. Um, I just, I guess I had a question since the theme was social protection. Like when we think of poverty, there's like two features. There's like poor people have low levels of income, but the other thing we know is they have incredible amount of variance, right? There's like incredible amounts of volatility in what they face. And, um, and I was just, and you know, Jonathan Murdoch has recent work actually showing that poverty is not very stable. There's a lot of people who are moving in and out of poverty th throughout the year over time. And so I was just wondering how you guys think about kind of the relevance of, of levels versus variance. And, and there could be an argument to be made when we think about social protection policy that, um, you know, variance is, it, like, is that, equally important, more important, less important than levels for not just welfare, but also your ability to achieve upward mobility. Like we have a lot of evidence like from Chris's work and, and other work that people don't invest in profitable technologies because of expected variance or you, there's like other ways where you might think it matters. So I was wondering what your view is on whether we know enough or how, what is our state of knowledge of like the importance of levels versus variance and how that might or should inform the debate on social protection. Because for example, in the US, all of social protection is about variance. It's not about you know, levels as much or so on. So, thank you. I think that, that's a very well taken point and that's the argument that I was trying to make earlier that is the uncertainty that we need to work with. So having conditional loans or conditional credit that you, know, you get it only if the bad state happens you don't have to have it all the time. So all of these are tools which exist in the private sector, which we have had experiments on, which can be imported, I think, into social protection. I think that is the first order problem. I, I fully agree. Okay. Person over here, and then we'll move back. Yeah. Yeah. And thank you, and thank you very much to the presentations and the discussions. Now, I'm speaking perhaps on behalf of uh, the African researcher who does not have the luxury of conducting, uh, you know, RCTs. And quite often we, uh, uh, we have uh, secondary data to use now uh, to the first uh, presentation. So we conducted a little study using secondary data for Malawi. I think we found that uh, there, was, uh, there was a crowding in effect of um, uh, the remittances, like small grants. Um, so it enabled the households, recipient households, to at least engage in businesses for future uh, incomes. But now I had you speaking about potential crowd out of, of, of consumption, perhaps reduction on, on consumption. So for us, a student or a researcher who's using secondary data, what should they look out for uh, if the data and it does not contain both, say, variables? You won't have data on consumption, but you might have data on uh, the, recipi the, the receipts that they're getting. So that's the first question, and I think to uh, the one of the uh, Yudri or uh, Abhijay was saying that um, farmers, yeah, we're looking at the po possibility of uh, financial inclusion, so you're talking about uh, uh, insurance, micro insurance for the firmers. So we were kind of thinking how, what has been the, what has been the consensus so far, what have you found in terms of the extent to which uh, inclusion can actually mitigate, you know, these uh, climate shocks and on the overall welfare of the household. What has been the findings? I mean, I'm grappling with some research in that area and some pointers, yes, would be beneficial. Thank you very much. 
So, uh, two points in answer to your question. Unfortunately, also with many RCTs, we don't have all the variables because when we design the RCT, we don't know what we're going to find, so <laughs> we, we don't know what we're going to need. Um, I think it is important to go with uh, open mind and try to uh, have theory guide you with, with, uh, to interpret the data. So, and the other important thing, which actually secondary data have an advantage on, is the, to look in the long run. Because with the RCTs, we almost often just do a couple of years, and things change over the course of, uh, of time. So I think that is one advantage. Many things can be identified by looking at change over time, rather than just a one, one cross-section. Chris? OK, yeah. Um, so my response is actually going to also talk about Supreet's comment at the same time. I think that, um, well, Sal drew is a great example. Um, the, the availability of panel data um, can help us understand the issue of volatility versus levels when talking about poverty and understanding the transitions of people in and out of poverty. Um, and uh, if, if I was, in fact, I am making use of the stunningly um, valuable World Bank living standards measurement surveys, integrated surveys on agriculture set of, um, of data sets, which provides you with panel data, with great uh, information on, on, on shocks, on financial market access and use, and you can relate it to consumption and income and investment in the future. Um, so I think there's a lot of work to be done with the growing availability of high quality secondary, uh, primary data that's, that's publicly available. Um, I think, you want to yeah. come quickly? Just a yeah. small point, which is that I think one of the, uh, one of the relatively underexploited opportunities is when there's an RCT, there, there, there is actually often a, a paper and then little follow up and that's related to point Chris was making. But I, I think that follow-up is actually uh, another paper and the original randomization is usually available. It's so so it's, it's, it's actually something to think about is, you know, take the, the randomization and then follow up. The treatment was done 10 years ago, but you can still go back to those. We, we are going back, so it's, it's not a, it's, a, it's often very interesting and rewarding thing to do. And, and open to yeah, and available. And yeah. available. Yeah. Um, that's gonna, we're going to take one last question. The good news is that we're heading into a coffee break, uh, <laughs> so <laughs> you can grab the speakers uh, afterwards. Um, and of course, this is just the first session of many over the next few days. So those that are part of the in group, I'm sure you'll get a chance to uh, to ask questions. The, yeah, you in the back with your hand up. Thank you very much, and I must appreciate all the um, insights so far. I just want to ask a question on initial conditions. Um, I don't know if you give someone a cow in a particular village. I think it's a big assumption to think that with that cow, the person is most likely to be very productive or productive and then interge intergenerationally productive. Initial conditions that I mean is the norms, the societal values, the belief systems. I think once those preconditions or initial conditions are well understood, then on the premise of that, um, to go be a good platform for those forms of interventions. So um, to what extent are these factors taken into consideration when you have to do some of these interventions? So that we don't begin to assume that if you give a farmer this, this would definitely happen. Because those preconditions can actually, because I'm thinking of a system where somebody thinks this is free money or free intervention, and they make a mess of it. It's going to be a big assumption to think, OK, he would do well with it or he would not do well with it because of where he's coming from. And that, I think, it's very important. But I don't know to what extent these um, studies take this into consideration before they embark on these interventions or before they do this. 
Um, Thank you. I, I um, think all, all three of them could answer that question, but maybe we'll start uh, with you. Yeah, I, I completely agree. So the, the intervention that we evaluated was actually designed and implemented by an organization that has lots of experience on this, and precisely to make it acceptable to the rest of the village. They had set up village committees. I didn't have time to go into the great details, but they had set up village committees that uh, owned the intervention so that there would be no rivalry between the village, no bad feelings towards yeah, the big transfer that was given to the poor. So it comes back to the point that, I, that Chris made about heterogeneity. Like things, the effectiveness of intervention depends on a lot of things that we don't know. And we should see it through the lens. We have to know, we do, do as much as possible to see through the lens of the specific context. Completely agree with you. Um. I, I, I just, just to, I mean, I, I think that we don't, uh, I think in all of these uh, studies, there is a, a pre, pre phase which has not been described, which is often, you know, is this a sensible thing to do? <laughs> Are, uh, and, it's, and we don't, so I don't think the most of the studies are done by entirely naively, and that's a good thing. Uh, so I, I think that, uh, and, uh, and, some, and I think in many ways, that work is actually very useful work too. Just to add to what I said before about, uh, you know, around the cities, I want to add one more point to that, which is that in fact, for those of you who are interested in doing more cities in Jepal, now we have a lot more funding for those available for what we call the African Scholars Program. So please do apply. That's great. Chris, do you want yeah, last no, word? I just agree. Okay, <laughs> that's very good. Never stand between people and coffee. Um, so, uh, thank you for to you, Ariana, to Abhijit and Chris for a really tremendous panel. Um, for the non-economists here, I hope it's uh, been helpful to you in terms of understanding what we do know and what we don't know, and that we take data seriously. Uh, and although it's a dismal science we still do have some claim to the science part of it. Um, <laughs> if you're interested in reading further about economics, I happen to be chair of a charity called coreecon.org, which is a free online open platform introductory economics, which is designed uh, for non-specialists and has a lot of this sort of work embedded uh, in it. I'd encourage you to look at that. For those that um, economists here that want a relaxing constraint, as Abhijit uh, uh, advocated, I would recommend applying to STIAS. Uh, I've been a fellow here for the last two months. It's been a huge pleasure, uh, and it's incredibly productive and creative space uh, for the mind. So I'd, I'd encourage the participants to do that. And um, to all of you, I'm not going to try and summarize uh, what I think has been a tremendously rich uh, set of uh, interventions, but I'm sure they will stay with you for a very long time and guide us uh, in the remaining uh, sessions in this uh, symposium. So thanks for a tremendous start to uh, my fellow panelists and um, those that are staying, get back in time after the coffee. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.